The first lady has a complex job. She isn't paid and doesn't even really have an official position, but she always has to look perfect, represent her country well, and champion her own causes. We expect a lot from a person who only got there because of someone else's ambitions. But not all first ladies have towed the line. Some of them found ways of being themselves in a manner that was a little unfirst ladylike and some of them were just plain weird. Here's what you might not know about the former first ladies of America. Party Animal James Madison's wife, Dolly, would prove to be one of the 1800s' biggest party animals. And while it might seem silly now, throwing huge shindigs like she did was a little taboo at the time. Every week, she hosted her so-called Wednesday Night Squeezes and invited everyone from politicians to celebrities to shoemakers off the street. Dolly wanted to include a true cross-section of her countrymen. By the end of the day, it was like, the more, the merrier. On top of that, she also tended to dress a little provocatively at her soirees. Dolly Madison might not have been the first society woman to live in the White House, but she was, perhaps, the busiest. Ghost Hunter Of all the first ladies, Mary Todd Lincoln is perhaps the most famous for being odd. After losing two of her children, she turned to spiritualism, as she was sure that their ghosts showed up at the end of her bed every night and were trying to contact her. Her seances were led by a variety of mediums and took place at the White House, and President Lincoln attended at least one of them. Not an endless journey of wonder and discovery! Amazingly, if Lincoln had listened to the warnings of one medium, he might have escaped his fate. Ordinarily, telling a president people are out to get him might be worth a shrug, but Charles Colchester had more reason to know the truth than most people. He just so happened to be drinking buddies with John Wilkes Booth, who wasn't shy when it came to talking about his desire to harm Abe. Forget ethereal spirits, it was the sharing of earthly spirits that might have saved him. After her husband's untimely passing, Mary Todd became even more into her rituals, attending a spiritualist commune for a few days. She eventually visited a famous ghost photographer, who superimposed an image of her late husband behind her, but made it look like his spirit was lingering around her, just as she would want. Bad Medicine when it came to the occult, Florence Harding was all in as well. She grew up surrounded by people who put hexes on their barns to ward off evil spirits. So when she got to the White House, she hired a clairvoyant to sniff out anyone in the administration who was out to get her husband. In addition to her belief in mediums, she also bought into homeopathy. When she had a kidney issue, she was so impressed with her treatment that she had her husband bring her doctor to Washington and appoint him as the official presidential physician. This would prove fatal, however, when that medic misdiagnosed President Warren G. Harding's heart attack as mere food poisoning, and the flub cost him his life. You idiot! <laughs> Groovy chick. Betty Ford might have become First Lady suddenly due to the resignation of Richard Nixon, but she wasn't going to let her new role cramp her style. She was a true child of the 1970s, no matter what her real age, and she indulged in many of the fads. This involved wearing a mood ring and dancing around the halls of the White House. She even spoke in radically modern terms about people using marijuana and having premarital relations, and she wasn't shy when it came to talking about her progressive political positions. I think I'm a feminist, really. The Equal Rights Amendment is a necessity of life. But her biggest cliché 70s thing was using a CB radio. In 1976, the First Lady was dealing with chronic arthritis and couldn't join her husband on the campaign trail, so she got her own license and campaigned for him through the CB. Her handle was Big Mama. Of course, despite her quirks, Ford is perhaps best known for her very candid experience battling addiction, which led to the foundation of the Betty Ford Center and made her name forever associated with alcohol recovery efforts. Astrology Addict Nancy Reagan came from Hollywood, so it is not too surprising she brought some strange habits to Washington. But instead of following fad diets or signing on to ad campaigns, she picked up astrology, and she picked it up hard. What had been a mere pastime became an absolute obsession after Ronald Reagan was shot. From then on, she had her astrologer plan virtually every event in the president's life in order to keep him safe, even though she only ever met her once. I timed most of the speeches. I timed when he would take Air Force One, when he would take off, and when he would land. Nancy tried to hide her reliance on the controversial calendar maker by paying through a third party, but the public still found out, and she was mercilessly mocked for the rest of her life. Hey, I, I didn't want to get into a Nancy Reagan uh, thing about, you know, doing any seances.
infidelity, disease, and faith after loss. This isn't the plot to a drama movie. This is Jackie and JFK's real life in its stormiest moments. Back before such relationships became fairly unheard of, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Charles Bartlett was a close friend and confidant of John F. Kennedy, so much so that in 1951, he played matchmaker for what would become one of America's most iconic couples. It was at one of Bartlett's dinner parties that John F. Kennedy first met Jacqueline Bouvier. At the time, Bouvier was working as a reporter for the Washington Times Herald. At the time, she later explained to Edward R. Murrow, her professional interests came before any romantic ones. Shortly after meeting Kennedy, Bouvier interviewed him for her paper. When Murrow asked whether marriage or interviews with a politician required more diplomacy, Bouvier let her husband answer. Well, now, which requires the most diplomacy, to interview senators or to be married to one? Well, not being married to one, I guess. <laughs> Bartlett largely kept JFK's secrets, but once evidence of Kennedy's many love affairs came to light, Bartlett mused that his friend might not have been suited to marriage, but that he never would have become president without Bouvier by his side. While Jack won the votes, she won the hearts of America. John F. Kennedy and Jackie Bouvier dated for two years before announcing their engagement on June 24, 1953. As both were members of prominent society families, the announcement was a notable affair, and its historical significance only increased as the Kennedys rose to political power. So it's perhaps understandable that a venue would claim to be the spot where Kennedy first popped the question, and that there might be some competition for that claim. Two stories exist around where and how Kennedy proposed to Bouvier. The Omni Hotels and Resorts chain claim that it happened at one of their hotels. In their version, the couple was staying at Omni Parker House in Boston, Massachusetts, and eating in the hotel restaurant when Kennedy got down on one knee and presented Bouvier with a custom-made emerald and diamond ring. Omni claims it was the most romantic moment in the hotel's history. We insist that this was the formal proposal and all the rest are our alternative facts. <laughs> Unless it happened at Martin's Tavern. Martin's is an historic restaurant in Georgetown that was frequently patronized by Kennedy and Bouvier. The restaurant claims the proposal happened in Booth 3. They even got the statement of a witness, former ambassador Marion Smoke. But Smoke didn't claim to have seen the proposal, only that he saw the couple at Martin's on June 24th, and that news of the engagement circulated through the restaurant. The relationship between John F. Kennedy and Jackie Bouvier was complicated from the beginning. They had similar backgrounds, shared a knack for social engagements, and had a genuine attraction and affection for one another. But their engagement and marriage was as much a political consideration as a personal commitment. According to Robert Dalek's An Unfinished Life, John F. Kennedy, 1917 to 1963, Kennedy would have been happy to remain a bachelor and at least one close friend suspected he would have had his 1952 Senate bid failed. But it didn't, and the realities of the time required any senator intent on higher office to be married. Kennedy was driven even then, although his father worried that his son would still get cold feet on the way to the altar. You're pretty much in love with him, aren't you? <laughs> oh, no. For her part, Bouvier was under no illusions about the political component of her relationship with Kennedy. She wrote in her diary that she had an intimation that Jack would have a profound and possibly disturbing effect on her life. In letters to Irish priest Joseph Leonard, she expressed amazement at the level of ambition on display among the political class she encountered through Kennedy. She compared her fiancé to Macbeth due to the enormity of his appetite for high office. Bouvier also confided to Leonard that she had reservations about the impending marriage. Her own father was a notorious philanderer, whose cheating took a heavy toll on his wife, and Bouvier saw the same quality in Kennedy. When John F. Kennedy and Jackie Bouvier became Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy on September 12, 1953, they did so in style. Their wedding was held at St. Mary's Catholic Church in Newport, Rhode Island, and the reception at the Victorian Hammersmith Farm Estate. Both boasted a massive attendance. The wedding had over 800 guests. The reception, over 1,200. Pope Pius XII sent a blessing to be read, Robert F. Kennedy was the best man, and the wedding cake was over four feet tall. Musical entertainment included noted tenor Luigi Vena, 
and the Meyer Davis Orchestra. Jackie's dress, accentuated by her grandmother's veil, and a few choice pieces of jewelry gifted by John, remains a model for wedding gowns to this day. According to Vogue, the dress was designed by Anne Lowe, one of the first leading black fashion designers, who built a career out of creating fashions for women of the social register. For how celebrated the look has become, it was actually a hastily assembled replacement for the original dress. Destroyed by a burst pipe, Lowe's closest collaborator on the dress wasn't the bride, but Joseph Kennedy, who subsequently left Lowe's name out of the wedding coverage he arranged. The Kennedys honeymooned in Acapulco. John messaged his parents from there to report that everything was going well. According to Frederick Lodgefall's JFK Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956, Kennedy's exact words were, At last I know the true meaning of rapture. It's no secret by now that John F. Kennedy was not a faithful husband. Within 15 months of marrying Jackie Bouvier Kennedy, he was back to his womanizing ways. Where sex was concerned, John F. Kennedy thought he was untouchable, invulnerable. So wandering was his eye that he reportedly left his wife alone at parties to fool around with female guests. And in 1956, he carried on with several women on his yacht, even as Jackie suffered through delivery of their stillborn child. To what extent Jackie knew about John's infidelities and how she felt about them is a matter of some contention among journalists and historians. Author Sally Bedell Smith wrote in Vanity Fair that while Jackie was well aware of the affairs, she was often happy to feign ignorance. She would occasionally make private jokes or, in more unhappy moments, seek counseling from cardiologist friend Frank Finnerty, but she was resigned to it. She reportedly told Adley Stevenson, I don't care how many girls Jack sleeps with, as long as I know, he knows it's wrong. Others have reported that Jackie was more confrontational about the affairs. Author J. Randy Taraborelli told People that tensions became so pitched that Jackie considered divorce in 1956, after the stillbirth. Her sister and her mother, both aware of John's affairs, convinced her to stay. They considered being cheated on an occupational hazard of being married to a powerful man. In a letter to Fletcher Knable, Jackie Kennedy described herself and her husband as icebergs, a small portion of their lives visible, the greater mass submerged. Among the matters kept below was how difficult it was for them to conceive a child. Jackie suffered a miscarriage in 1955 and delivered a stillborn daughter in 1956. When they did have a son, John Jr., he was born prematurely and suffered from weak lungs in early life. By the time John Jr. and their daughter, Caroline, came into the world, JFK was far less callous about his wife and children. He was at Jackie's side with her favorite flowers for Caroline's birth and noticeably swelled with emotion when discussing his daughter. The couple were expecting a third child in 1963. But on August 7th, 20 years to the day that JFK was rescued during World War II, Jackie went into premature labor. Their son, Patrick, came six weeks early and, despite the best efforts of doctors, died of hyaline membrane disease within days. Both parents were devastated, but family and friends reported that the tragedy did leave one positive legacy. In the months remaining before JFK's assassination, he and Jackie were much more publicly affectionate with one another. Some of the ice, it seemed, had emerged from the depths. As the youngest man ever elected to the presidency, John F. Kennedy was seen by the public as a healthy, clean-cut shot of energy into the highest levels of power. But, contrary to the image he projected, Kennedy's presidency and his marriage were dogged by his myriad health conditions. In 2019, PBS published a list of all the physical ailments he suffered, including many that were kept well hidden from the public eye during John's lifetime. If the public knew how many medical problems he had, I think it would have uh, destroyed his presidential ambitions. Besides a bout of scarlet fever in his youth, the president suffered from spastic colitis, prostate and urinary tract issues, allergies, such severe lower back pain that he was initially rejected from military service in World War II, and Addison's disease, a life-threatening hormonal deficiency. He was so ill that his father had put cortisone treatments in safe deposit boxes around the country if he ever needed them because of his Addison's disease.
The steroids used to treat his Addison's led to osteoporosis, which only further damaged Kennedy's back. Seven surgeries between 1944 and 1957 couldn't fix it, and he fell so ill after one procedure that a priest was called to administer last rites. The steroids and other medications came with side effects. In 1962, according to The Atlantic, Jackie complained to her husband's gastroenterologist that the antihistamines used for his allergies resulted in depression. The doctor's answer was a two-day treatment with the antipsychotic Stelazine, with reported total success. But the rest of John's many ailments would follow him to the end of his days. It might well be assumed that a president and vice president would get along, or at least have confidence in one another. After all, the president must have confidence that, should anything happen to them, their running mate could serve as chief executive of the world's most powerful country. But, according to a series of interviews given by Jackie Kennedy in 1964, neither she nor her husband thought much of Lyndon B. Johnson. According to Jackie, John not only didn't like Johnson, but never wanted him as a running mate and actively feared for the country, should he become president. John discussed his worries with his wife and his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. No thought was given to dropping Johnson from the 1964 ticket, but the Kennedy brothers discussed ways they might maneuver around Johnson to find a new standard bearer for the Democratic Party for the 1968 presidential election. The same interviews, kept private by the Kennedy family for decades, revealed Jackie's thoughts about the second lady, too. According to the Daily Beast, she described Lady Bird Johnson as so devoted and obedient to her husband that she seemed more like a hunting dog than a marriage partner. Context is important in this case. The interviews were recorded during tensions between Johnson and Robert Kennedy, and Jackie separated Johnson's deficient political skills, in her view, from his personal qualities. A marriage connected to a demanding job, let alone the presidency, will inevitably face some stress, but the ongoing health woes and extramarital affairs of John F. Kennedy only made things more difficult for Jackie Kennedy. The degree of independence Jack maintained shocked her in the early days of their marriage. And in private correspondence with Father Joseph Leonard, Jackie confided that life with a powerful public figure was taking its toll. As reported by the Irish Times, she wrote, Maybe I'm just dazzled and picture myself in a glittering world of crowned heads and men of destiny, and not just a sad little housewife. That world can be very glamorous from the outside, but if you're in it, and you're lonely, it could be a hell. Despite the many tensions and complications in their marriage, John and Jackie were always able to reconcile. I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. Jackie turned for help to the Catholic faith that she shared with her husband. In one of her letters to Leonard, Jackie cited her religion as helping her to find some good after the tragedy of her stillborn daughter, Arabella. She and John grew closer together, but after John's assassination, she suffered a crisis of faith. She told Leonard that she felt bitter and that only the hope of seeing her husband again sustained her belief. Being President of the United States is a rare honor, but there are some strings attached once a Commander-in-Chief leaves the Oval Office. Here are some of the things they can and can't do after they step down. While being one of the most powerful individuals in the world might seem like it would include the ability to do pretty much anything you want, this isn't necessarily the case. Because of their constant Secret Service detail, it's hard to be spontaneous. The Secret Service needs plenty of advance notice to prepare for any public outings, as their typical setup is to create multiple perimeter rings around their charge. This means that anywhere a former president wants to go typically needs to be scouted out days or even months beforehand. If a trip can't meet the standards of the Secret Service, there's a good possibility they will put a stop to it immediately. As former Secret Service agent Jonathan Wackrow told NBC News, if the protectee disagrees with a security assessment, we're not going to just say okay, we're going to actually push back. It's possible a compromise can be met, but safety and security always take precedence. While security teams are trained to be able to think on their feet to make changes on the fly, anything that can be planned beforehand needs to happen to eliminate as many variables as possible. Being ahead of as many potential threats as possible is a huge part of the Secret Service detail's job. As of 2001, via an act of Congress, the President of the United States earns an annual salary of $400,000. After they leave office and for the rest of their lives, the now former President continues to receive a taxpayer-funded paycheck, slightly more than half of what it would have been to that point. In 2021, that annual pension amounted to $221,400. 
That's how much Donald Trump is entitled. Although had the Senate convicted him of charges raised in a second impeachment trial in 2021, he may have been barred from receiving that sum, as presidents removed from office are barred from that perpetual retirement fund. The exact amount of the pension sum can change over time. According to the Congressional Research Service, the ex-presidential paycheck is equal to that of the head of a cabinet-level department like defense, state, or commerce. But not every president has held the right to a pension. Congress passed the former President's Act of 1958 to ensure that ex-commanders-in-chief would be provided for after Harry Truman, upon leaving office in 1953, declined almost every job offer that came his way out of principle. He found those positions to be beneath the stature of the presidency and lived mostly off his $112.56 monthly army pension. That act of government bumped his monthly income up to $25,000. If you've ever moved on from a job, taken a look at the person they replaced you with, and thought, wow, they're just awful, congratulations, you're a normal, everyday person. Criticizing the people who held a job before and after you is part of work life. It can be both cathartic and helpful coming up with clever ways to say mean things about people you barely know. Previous presidents don't have this luxury, however. While it's not an actual rule, an ex-president isn't supposed to talk smack about any other presidents, according to an unwritten White House tradition that's been passed down since practically the founding of the country. Basically, retired presidents are expected to stay out of the affairs of the current president, and also avoid saying anything untoward about any other former presidents. You may have noticed this rule gets broken a lot. That's actually a pretty recent phenomenon, only cropping up since the beginning of the 21st century. As partisanship has increased over the last two decades, the same has been true for former presidents openly criticizing whoever's currently in charge. Barack Obama heavily criticized Donald Trump for many things, not least of which for his administration's handling of the COVID-19 response efforts. More than anything, this pandemic has fully, finally torn back the curtain on the idea that so many of the folks in charge know what they're doing. However, he hasn't been the only one, and as harsher words for political foes continue to become more and more normalized, we'll likely see this tradition disappear in the years to come. Each former president in good standing enjoys a hefty expense budget, which includes travel. According to an official who spoke to Politico, ex-presidents routinely engage in diplomatic and humanitarian activities overseas and serve as diplomatic emissaries on behalf of the U.S. For that, their extensive travel costs are reimbursed, as are their other costs of professional life, all of which are reviewed by the General Services Administration. Likely, the most expensive item incurred by former presidents, for which the government puts the bill, is office space, from which the ex-executive handles their various business and public affairs. The National Taxpayers Union Foundation said that the paid-for protections kick in six months after the president leaves the Oval Office. It covers setting up, furnishing, and staffing a new office anywhere they like within the U.S. Former Presidents Barack Obama, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton racked up office rent charges of $500,000 each in 2020. The former President's Act of 1958 provides more than just a substantial pension to ex-Oval Office occupants. It also obligates presidents no longer serving to accept certain perks. One of the largest is that two-term ex-presidents get to enroll in the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. To qualify for this government-funded health insurance program, they're subject to the same rules as other federal employees, chiefly being a federal employee for five years or more. Being president for eight years immediately makes a person eligible. This leaves out surviving one-term presidents Jimmy Carter and Donald Trump, neither of whom held a top governmental position before or after their presidencies. Those costs associated with health care aren't completely free for former presidents, though. The federal government, via taxpayers, covers about 75% of a former president's health costs, while the former chief executive is responsible for coming up with the remaining 25%. According to government and finance analyst Stephanie Smith, former presidents, as well as their spouses and children under 18, can seek medical treatment at military hospitals. This includes the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center outside Washington, D.C. The ex-president and their close relatives are technically secretarial designees, whose care falls under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of Defense. According to the General Services Administration, the U.S. federal government owns the president's guest house, also known as Blair House. It's a suite of townhome-style buildings in Washington, D.C. that occupies the west side of Lafayette Square and the 700 block of Jackson Place. In the middle of this row of connected buildings at 716 Jackson Place is a townhouse purchased by the federal government in the late 1950s. It was decreed the presidential townhouse in 1969 thanks to an executive order by then-President Richard Nixon. Built in the 1860s, it's the former home of Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. But as of Nixon's declaration, it's the official temporary place of residence for former U.S. presidents visiting Washington, D.C. for state business, pleasure, or other ex-presidential reasons. The unassuming but elegant four-story house is painted white and features sandstone steps. 
Formerly a drab, bland, largely undecorated collection of rooms, President George W. Bush arranged for private funding to spruce up and populate the residence, which Nixon set up as a goodwill gesture toward his predecessor, Lyndon Johnson. LBJ never stayed in the presidential townhouse, while Gerald Ford became the first to use it more than a decade later. To book a stay, one of the five living ex-presidents must consult with a liaison at the White House, which is a one-minute walk away from the presidential townhouse. By the nature of their job as the President of the United States, those who lived and worked in the White House are made privy to scores of sensitive, classified, and top-secret information. They're informed on everything from nuclear weapon launch procedures to the identities of spies deep undercover in adversarial governments. Not only would it be dangerous if not catastrophic if an outgoing president shared or sold the state secrets they knew, it's illegal. The damage might already be done by the time authorities catch up with a former president accused of what amounts to high treason. National Security Attorney Bradley Moss told the Washington Post that merely freely handing over classified information is a federal felony. Selling it would be more egregious. Moss said, doing so for profit could implicate additional criminal provisions, plain and simple. Following the 1945 in-office death of four-time elected Democratic President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Republican-controlled Congress began efforts to pass what became ratified into law as the 22nd Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Per the text of the amendment, it established term limits. It reads, No person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice, and no person who has held the office of president or acted as president for more than two years of a term to which some other person was elected president shall be elected to the office of the president more than once. This means that a person who won their election and then re-election can serve those eight years, while another who ascended to the presidency when the office became open due to death or removal can serve two full terms and the remainder of their predecessor's term, as long as the event took place after the halfway point of their term. Of the former presidents still alive, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama served two full terms each, making them ineligible for being president again. Carter and Trump, one-term office holders, could run and serve again should they choose to do so. Two-termers can't become vice president. It's laid out in the Twelfth Amendment text, which states that, No person constitutionally ineligible to the office of president shall be eligible to that of vice president to the United States. One of the first tasks a new president undertakes upon inauguration is planning their eventual funeral. It's federal law for American flags to be flown at half-mass for a full 30 days following the death of a president. Whatever the president asked for in their funeral, which often includes some kind of military procession and or flyover, is executed during this time. It's carried out under the purview of the Commanding General, Military District of Washington of the U.S. Army. And this is considered a major national event, and they had all of four days to plan for it. It's a, it's a big, big security um, operation. Required arrangements, as described in the official legally adhering pamphlet State, Official, and Special Military Funerals, includes the directive that the presidential body may lie in repose for one day. From there, it's moved to the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol to lie in state. During this time, the public may pay their respects. Two cabinet-level offices, Defense and State, coordinate with the commanding general to organize the state funeral. Following the service, the president is buried, and as the commander-in-chief of the U.S. military, they are entitled but not obligated to a ceremony and plot at Arlington National Cemetery. Only two presidents made Arlington their resting place, William Howard Taft and John F. Kennedy. The others chose to be buried in their hometown or a place that was special to them. Honors that would be conferred during the Arlington ceremony are thusly bestowed at the departure point for the body, be it a train station or airport awaiting the vehicle that will take the deceased president to their final home. As of 2021, an American president that leaves office begins to receive payments toward a yearly pension of $221,400. They'll continue to receive that figure until it's changed by lawmakers or their death. But the government that the former president once led doesn't leave the deceased surviving spouse, should they have one, entirely high and dry. Per a clause of the Former Presidents Act, the widow of each former president shall be entitled to receive a monetary allowance. Keep in mind that the law was drafted at a time when a dollar went a lot farther than it does today, and when the idea of a male first spouse wasn't even a consideration. So it shouldn't be surprising that the amount is a mere $20,000 a year, paid in monthly installments by the Treasury Department. However, to receive that monthly check for $1,666.67, the deceased president's spouse has to reject all other government pensions or entitlements. He or she is also disqualified from the pension if they are under the age of 60 and remarry, or they are appointed or elected to a paid federal government position. Former presidents are required to begin their transition to post-presidential life while they're still president. Six months before the November election, the commander-in-chief must form their White House Transition Coordinating Council, 
It's headed up by a long-serving member of the president's staff and filled out by other appointed officials selected from the cabinet. This includes agencies like the Office of Management and Budget, the Office of Personnel Management, the Office of Government Ethics, and representatives of the General Services Administration and the Archivist of the United States. Together, the Council serves as a board of guides and consultants to the President and communicates with the transition teams of both the old and new Presidents. This structure is mainly in place to ensure effective, open, and safe sharing of information between the outgoing administration's employees and those who will replace them in the new administration. The council works into the early months of the succeeding presidential administration, and their activities are paid for by the federal government. According to the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the last presidential transition in 2020 to 2021 was budgeted at just over $9 million. If one of your parents is the president, you're expected to behave well under the glare of the public eye. But these presidential children were total troublemakers. There's nothing like being young and on top of the world. College kids partaking in underage drinking is typically about as scandalous as some mild jaywalking. But when you are the child of a president, it doesn't matter how awesome the kegger down the street is. Still, teens will be teens, and being the president's children wasn't going to stop the Bush twins from indulging in some mild adolescent hell-raising. For Barbara and Jenna Bush, the year 2001 was just one major buzzkill after another. In February, Jenna's 18-year-old boyfriend was arrested for public drunkenness and had to be picked up from county jail by the Secret Service. In May, both Jenna and Barbara were caught trying to buy alcohol using a fake ID. This was just two weeks after Jenna appeared in court charged with underage drinking. She was fined $51.25 and sentenced to eight hours of community service and six hours of alcohol awareness classes. The media had a field day with the court appearance and for some reason fixated on the toe ring she wore that day. Patty Davis, who was 28 at the time of her father Ronald Reagan's inauguration, was a liberal college dropout who made her opposition to some of her father's policies very well known both during and after his presidency. She was most notably active in the campaign against nuclear weapons, even speaking at anti-nuclear rallies. In fact, she once brought a prominent anti-nuclear activist to the White House to speak with her father. She didn't let her mom Nancy off the hook either, as she considered her anti-drug campaign in particular to be short-sighted. This dissidence opened up a rift between Davis and her parents, which only widened further. She was critical of both of her parents in a 1992 autobiography, and in 1994 she appeared nude on the cover of Playboy. Davis and her parents started to heal their strained relationship shortly before her father's death in 2004. She still had a bit of a wild streak as she posed nude again in 2011, this time for Moore magazine. But otherwise, the rebellious former first daughter has cooled her jets somewhat, and Reaganist conservatives around the country have been having significantly fewer heart attacks. Before becoming president himself and making everyone forget about his youthful antics, George H.W. Bush's eldest son made a name for himself as a hard-drinking party boy in his younger years. Right after college, he had a period during which he partied, dated with abandon, and would sometimes go months without a job. He was an undeniable charmer, though, the kind of guy who'd drink you under the table, steal your girl, and still invite you to watch the ball game with him that weekend. More controversially, he signed up for pilot training with the National Guard in 1968, suspected by some as a way to avoid being drafted during the Vietnam War, although Bush denied this. Then, of course, came the George W. Bush presidency, and with it, the Iraq War, a brewing financial crisis, and plenty of other scandals and missteps. These days, he spends most of his time painting portraits, rather than painting himself into a corner. President Reagan's youngest son, Ron, wasn't the biggest thorn in the family side when his father was in office, as his sister Patty was stirring up plenty of trouble. But he definitely proved to be cut from the same cloth, and his own disruptive tendencies would eventually reveal themselves in a pretty big way. Like Patty, Ron had liberal views that were usually at odds with his father's politics. But while he didn't make the same kind of name for himself that his sister did during his dad's presidency, he did become more outspoken as the years went on. He caused his biggest splash in 2011 when he released My Father at 100, a memoir about his life with the former president, in which he claimed that the initial signs of his father's Alzheimer's were observable while he was still in office. This didn't sit well with his older brother Michael, who said he was outraged over Ron's comments. Taking it even further, he said Ron was an embarrassment to his father when he was alive, and an embarrassment to his mother after writing that book. Ron's troublemaking since then hasn't been nearly as incendiary, but he's still taken opportunities to let his liberal voice be heard, even promoting atheism in a 2014 commercial. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell.
Sometimes people start trouble for the right reasons, and a good dollop of disorder in the face of institutional oppression and abuse can be just what's needed. Not everyone was happy with how Jimmy Carter's activist daughter Amy chose to live her life throughout the 80s and 90s, but it's not hard to imagine that perhaps her pops approved of all the feathers she ruffled along the way. Amy was only nine years old when her father was elected, and it wasn't until after he left office that she started to make headlines as a committed political activist. Politically inclined and resolute in her beliefs from a young age, by the time she was in her late teens, she really wasn't playing around. She was arrested in 1985 during an anti-apartheid demonstration at the South African Embassy and again in 1987 during one of many anti-CIA demonstrations she'd been taking part in. She was dismissed from Brown University that same year for academic reasons, although a friend of hers speculated that the dismissal was probably because she focused more on political causes than on her classwork. Drunk driving, binge drinking, all-night ragers? The highest office in the land has attracted a surprisingly large number of heavy drinkers over the years. America's second president, John Adams, achieved many things before entering his presidency. Surprisingly, he may have done many of them while slightly drunk. Adams had a fondness for drinking, but he was especially fond of hard cider, which he once described as refreshing and salubrious. He started drinking it at Harvard and enjoyed it so much that he drank it every day for breakfast for most of his life. A daily splash of booze was so essential for Adams, in fact, that when he was getting ready to sail for France on the U.S. frigate Boston, Adams wrote a packing list for himself that included a keg of rum, a barrel of Madeira, and four dozen bottles of port. During the course of the First Continental Congress, he was also thoroughly inebriated. Martin Van Buren developed a reputation for really holding his liquor. Van Buren, whose presidency was marked by a number of disasters, probably badly needed a drink most of the time, and he was affectionately nicknamed Blue Whiskey Van as a result of his fondness for liquor. According to John R. Bumgarner's The Health of the Presidents, Van Buren was famous for never seeming drunk, even though he drank a great deal. On the other hand, Van Buren seems to have reflected on the dangers of alcoholism, and he once warned his son in a letter, what you may regard as an innocent and harmless indulgence will take you years to overcome in the public estimate. Prone to overindulgence himself, Van Buren drank so much wine, port, and Madeira, he already had a bad case of gout in his 50s. In the 19th century, President James Old Buck Buchanan was known for putting away enormous amounts of liquor and wine. He regularly replenished his supply of whiskey by buying 10 gallons of the stuff at a time, and newspapers from the era frequently referred to Buchanan's seemingly superhuman ability to drink without getting drunk. Famous newspaper mogul and friend of Buchanan, John Forney, once commented, The Madeira and sherry that he has consumed would fill more than one old cellar. He went on to remark that Buchanan typically drank multiple bottles in a single session, but congratulated him for remaining remarkably sober throughout. While Buchanan's demeanor may have remained unchanged by his drinking, his health was affected by his overconsumption of liquor. Later in life, like many other hardcore drinkers, Buchanan was saddled with a crippling case of gout. On paper, Buchanan was great. In practice, he was awful. Warren G. Harding's turbulent presidency is primarily remembered for sleaze, scandals, and illegal liquor. In addition to having extramarital affairs and running a crony government, Harding was a hated hypocrite who enjoyed late-night poker parties accompanied by lashings of booze. Despite supporting Prohibition when he was in the Senate, during his stint in the White House, Harding continued to drink freely. While in public, Harding complained that Americans were not following the law, but instead supporting bootleggers and relaxing at speakeasies. In private, the president was just as bad. He was not always discreet about it either. He once arrived drunk on whiskey to a meeting with a union leader at the Oval Office. Increasingly worried about being found out, Harding hid his own liquor cabinet in his bedroom for a time to cover his tracks. However, word got around that he was still drinking, which seriously damaged the president's reputation. Although he supposedly attempted to give up drinking for real in 1923, it was too little too late. He could not shake his sleazy image, and to make matters worse, the story broke that members of his corrupt poker circle were actually in cahoots with bootleggers. Thomas Jefferson's drinking habits ran toward the more tasteful end of the spectrum. He was obsessed with wine and wine collecting and wrote endless pages of notes on the subject. Throughout his life, Jefferson bought hundreds of bottles, and on the occasions he ran out, he expressed considerable distress about it. In 1815, for example, he wrote to one wine merchant, Disappointments in procuring supplies have at length left me without a drop of wine. I must therefore request you to send me a quarter cask of the best you have. Wine from long habit has become an indispensable for my health, which is now suffering by its disuse. Rowdy Southerner Lyndon B. Johnson had some dangerous drinking habits that caused a public scandal when they came to light in the 1960s. 
1964, Time Magazine broke the story that Johnson had gone out driving, racing down the road at great speed with an open cup of beer in the car. Johnson was transporting a group of reporters at the time, and he threw his hat over the speedometer in a weak attempt to disguise his reckless driving. This shocking episode of drunk driving was no isolated moment to poor judgment. Joseph Califano recalled in his memoir, Triumph and Tragedy of Lyndon Johnson, that he had also seen the president sipping a drink while on the road. Armed with a plastic cup filled with scotch and soda, Califano claims that when the pair went out for a drive, Johnson regularly slowed down to get a refill, stating, Johnson would hold his left arm outside the car, shaking the cup in ice. Secret service agent would run up to the car, take the cup, and go back to the station wagon. There, another agent would refill it with ice, scotch, and soda as the first agent trotted behind the wagon. Then the first agent would run the refilled cup up to LBJ's outstretched arm and waiting hand as the president's car moved slowly along. A great many mistakes have been made. Califano notes that, in general, the president also liked to finish the day with a glass of scotch. However, he finally slowed down and stopped completely when anxiety about the Vietnam War started to get to him. He dropped the scotch, feeling he should remain fully in control of his faculties. It may come as little surprise that the man who ended Prohibition really liked to drink. While Franklin D. Roosevelt did not regularly drink excessively, making a good cocktail was part of his daily routine, and he liked to experiment with new mixtures, sometimes with questionable results. Roosevelt referred to his evening wind-downs as the children's hour, a reference to the poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It was a chance for the president to play with the cocktail shaker among friends, and he was known to have forced his bizarre martinis on all in attendance. On one trip, this included Joseph Stalin, who remained unimpressed with the American concoction. Fond of changing the quantity of spirits he used in a completely artless fashion, Roosevelt's grandson Curtis Roosevelt once remarked that the president made the worst cocktails in the world. On the other hand, it is well known that he popularized the Dirty Martini, a tangy version of the drink that's made with brine, and he can be credited with the invention of the Haitian Libation, a mixture of dark rum, orange juice, egg white, and brown sugar. It's disputed how heavy Roosevelt's drinking actually was on the regular, but he typically liked to have two or three cocktails in the evening after dinner. His most notorious drinking bouts took place in the company of his friend and ally from across the pond, Winston Churchill. The pair allegedly worked late into the night, accompanied by Churchill's signature brandy and cigars, events it took Roosevelt many days to recover from. Often remembered as one of America's least successful presidents, Franklin Pierce's life was as depressing as his term in office was. Franklin, who upon losing his party's nomination, famously declared there's nothing left but to get drunk, was not just a heavy partier, but rather had severe alcoholism, an addiction that destroyed his life and well-being. Pierce's very religious wife helped him contain his drinking for a short while, but he would continually hit the bottle when life got tough. Although he had a brief flirtation with the temperance movement in the 1840s, Pierce never really got over his addiction, and he was crushed by the pressures of his life in office. The death of his only living son around the time he was elected as president pushed him to start drinking heavily again, and his group of very drunk friends made it difficult for him to quit. When Pierce retired, his drinking also got increasingly severe. John R. Bumgarner reports in his book, Health of the Presidents, that alcoholism seems to have run in Pierce's family, and that the president suffered numerous complications from his drinking throughout his life. In the end, the bottle ultimately killed him. He died of cirrhosis of the liver in 1869. America's first president set the standard for heavy drinking for every president after him. At the climax of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, George Washington threw a party along with 55 others and ran up a bar tab for 45 gallons of alcohol, paying the 2018 equivalent of $15,400, according to the Washington Post. Outside of special occasions, Washington was still a pretty big drinker. Washington Irving writes in George Washington A Biography that the president's daily routine consisted of a beer or cider followed by several glasses of Madeira after dinner. Beer was a particular favorite of his, so much so that he began brewing his own. But he also opened up a whiskey distillery at his place in Mount Vernon for making both rice and brandies. One of the beer recipes he left behind has since been recreated by the Coney Island Brewing Company, but sadly had a limited run. God bless George Washington! Ulysses S. Grant was an extremely heavy drinker who appears to have crossed the line into alcohol addiction for at least part of his life. In 1854, he was forced to resign from the army for his excessive boozy, and many people believe he was drunk throughout the entirety of the Civil War. Grant most likely developed his habit during his stint as a young man in the California Infantry, a place that had an extreme drinking culture even by the low standards of the day. A lieutenant who met Grant there once remarked, there was not a day passed but what these officers were drunk at least once, and mostly until the wee hours of the morning. 
Grant's fellow soldiers from this era went on to record that Grant was often reduced to a childlike state after just a few glasses and clearly could not handle his drink. Today, historians are divided on just how drunk Grant was later in life and whether he really was drinking before important battles. Whenever Grant struggled during the Civil War, the press tended to blame his alcohol, which seems to have been a recurring issue. At the Battle of Shiloh, for example, and during the Vicksburg Campaign, rumors about Grant's drinking were placed center stage. Others, including Grant's wife, dismissed the stories as malicious. Either way, by the time he accepted the sober office of the presidency, he appeared to have become more or less booze-free. President George W. Bush quit drinking for good after years of alcohol abuse and bad behavior. Although it is debatable whether or not Bush had an alcohol addiction, he definitely drank too much, and his love of getting smashed won him the disapproval of his friends and family. Bush's drinking habits went back to at least his college days at Yale, where he was celebrated for his drunken frat boy activities. Some of Bush's friends have testified that the former president was a binge drinker who was unable to stop once he started. By the age of 30, Bush hit a real low point when he was pulled over for drunk driving. His DUI got him fined and his license temporarily suspended. But it also became major political news when it was uncovered by the press during his campaign for president in 2000. I'm not proud of that. It wasn't the only time his drunken antics became public knowledge either. In 1986, Bush was involved in another infamous incident when he walked up to a Wall Street Journal reporter in public and, while drunk, said, You son of a bitch, I saw what you wrote. We're not going to forget this. Unlike some drunken presidents, however, Bush decided he had to change. At the age of 40, having become increasingly religious, Bush quit drinking for good. Many of you know that I quit drinking uh, alcohol in 1986, and it was the right decision for me to make. Betty Ford lived a rich life prior to becoming First Lady of the United States. When her husband became president, however, Ford's private struggles burst out into the public. This is the tragic real-life story of Betty Ford. Elizabeth Ann Bloomer was born in 1918 to William Bloomer and Hortense Neer. She was the couple's third child and only daughter. The Bloomers were wealthy. Betty's mother's family owned a thriving furniture business, and her father worked for the Royal Rubber Company in Grand Rapids. He was also likely an undiagnosed alcoholic for most of his life. In 1934, Betty turned 16. It was the height of the Great Depression, and her father had recently lost his job, which likely worsened his drinking problem. On the day before his 60th birthday, William Bloomer went out to the garage to work on the family car. Betty came home to find their garage door open and her father dead. The keys to the car were in the ignition and the gas tank was empty, implying the car had been left to run until it ran out of gas. The official cause of death was listed as carbon monoxide poisoning despite the garage door being open, but Betty acknowledged later in her life that her father very likely died by his own hand. She recalled that the first time she heard someone call her father an alcoholic was at his funeral. Betty's mother, Hortense, was a woman who valued social graces. She wanted to raise Betty to be a traditional society wife and began training her daughter in the role at a very young age. When Betty was just eight years old, her mother enrolled her in dance classes at a studio in Grand Rapids. What was supposed to be part of Betty's charm school training, however, quickly developed into a passion. By 14, Betty was helping to teach the next generation of dancers ballet, tap, and even modern dance. When she graduated, she went to Vermont to attend the Bennington School of Dance for two years, paying her own tuition with money she earned working in a department store. In 1940, when Betty was 22, she moved to New York City to pursue a professional dancing career. Her mother was horrified and convinced Betty to move back to Michigan in 1941. Betty took a full-time job at a local department store and excelled at it, earning several promotions. She gave up on a dance career, but not on dance itself. Betty continued giving dance lessons and even danced for herself throughout her life. Betty Bloomer returned to Grand Rapids from New York in 1941 and immediately became a hot commodity on the marriage circuit. She began dating a childhood friend named William Warren, who she had known since the age of 12. However, Betty's mother and new stepfather didn't approve of Warren, who drank heavily and was known as a free spirit. They didn't say anything explicitly to Betty, though, and in 1942, the young couple announced their engagement. They were married soon after. Bill worked as a traveling salesman, and he changed jobs frequently. Every time he took on a new territory, the couple would move, and Betty would find work at a local department store. But Bill often stayed out late, and his health deteriorated due to diabetes and his drinking. Betty became increasingly unhappy because she wanted a more stable life with a permanent home and kids. After a few years, she decided she wanted a divorce. However, just as Betty was writing Bill a letter asking for one, he fell into a diabetic coma. Betty spent several months dutifully caring for her ailing husband, but when he was healthy again, she divorced him. After extricating herself from her first marriage to Bill Warren, Betty didn't stay single for very long. Being a divorced woman in 1948 carried a bit of a stigma, but that didn't deter an ambitious young politician named Gerald Ford. 
Jerry, as she called him, was a hotshot lawyer and a former college football star. By all accounts, their romance quickly became an enduring lifelong passion, but it was also marred by politics from the very beginning. Jerry asked Betty to marry him in 1948, but immediately delayed their wedding ceremony because he was running for Congress and had to concentrate on his campaign. This was more than just making schedules work, though. Jerry was worried about the reaction of his conservative Republican supporters if he married a divorced ex-dancer and thought delaying their marriage would be the prudent decision. The trend continued. Jerry showed up late to their wedding because he attended a campaign event earlier in the day. Somehow, Betty overlooked these offenses and the Fords remained married for the next 58 years. Jerry Ford became Vice President of the United States in 1973 when Richard Nixon's running mate Spiro Agnew resigned in disgrace. Less than a year later, Nixon himself resigned when the mounting Watergate scandal seemed to guarantee his imminent impeachment. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Gerald Ford subsequently became President of the United States, which meant Betty Ford suddenly found herself the First Lady. This should have been a moment of triumph for the Fords, but it was almost immediately undermined by a health crisis. It happened when Betty accompanied a friend to a breast exam. While waiting at the doctor's office, Betty's friend encouraged her to have a breast exam as well. Betty agreed. As it turns out, that impulsive decision saved her life. The doctor found a marble-sized lump in her breast, and two days later, she underwent a radical mastectomy. Doctors removed her right breast entirely, along with some pectoral muscle and the lymph nodes. Dr. Lukash has assured me that she came through the operation all right. Betty Ford reacted to this setback in what would become known as typical fashion for this first lady. Instead of keeping her health struggles secret as would be expected, she made them public and used her position as first lady to drive awareness of breast cancer and the power of self-examination for women. Today, Ford is credited with normalizing discussions of cancer and women performing their own breast exams. She is also considered one of the early leaders of the women's breast cancer movement. When Betty Ford became First Lady in 1974, it was a time of rapid change in America when it came to women's roles. The president's wife had long been expected to silently support her husband and to engage mostly in social and charitable work. However, Betty had little patience for these expectations. In fact, one of her first official acts was to hold a press conference, which was the first press conference held by a First Lady since 1953. That set the tone. Ford became one of the most outspoken and opinionated First Ladies in history. She broke so many taboos, it's difficult to list them all. As people note, Ford spoke about the Equal Rights Amendment, speculated about her children's drug use, and shocked the country by discussing the sleeping arrangements with her husband. But her most shocking deviation from tradition was her vocal support for abortion rights. This support not only put her in opposition to most of her fellow Republicans, it was also the opposite of her husband's views. This led to the incredible situation where a First Lady openly disagreed with the President on a huge issue. Republican leaders eventually began referring to her as no lady and even furiously demanded Ford's resignation as First Lady. Gerald Ford became President of the United States without ever having run for the office. He would go on to serve 895 days as President, and his key achievement was restoring some sense of dignity to the office. He finally ran for President in 1976, but couldn't shed the Watergate baggage and lost to Jimmy Carter. As the New York Times notes, Ford had campaigned himself hoarse in the days before the election. So when the time came to admit defeat, it fell to Betty to get up in front of the cameras and concede the election she and Jerry had worked so hard towards. It's been the greatest honor of my husband's life to have served his fellow Americans. Betty Ford was an icon for many. She was a passionate champion of women's rights and an outspoken supporter of women's health. But what most people think of when they think of Betty Ford is her struggle with addiction and alcoholism. As noted by the National First Lady's Library, Ford's family had a history of alcoholism. But for much of her life, Betty Ford's drinking wasn't terribly problematic, especially during a time in the 20th century when heavy drinking was more sociably acceptable than it is today, and the concept of alcoholism as a disease hadn't yet become commonly understood. But as biographer Jeffrey S. Ashley writes, everything changed when Ford pinched a nerve in her neck in 1964. The pain was excruciating and never went away, and Ford dealt with it by taking a lot of prescription painkillers and drinking even more. Her drug abuse receded somewhat when she was first lady, but then got worse when she left the White House. Ford's concerned family staged an intervention in 1978 and convinced her that her painkiller addiction needed to be treated. Ford ultimately agreed to enter a rehabilitation facility. However, she was initially only willing to admit that she'd only become addicted to pain pills and refused to even consider that she might have a drinking problem. The pain medications had been prescribed, so she was able to rationalize her addiction as something normal. An addiction to prescribed medications didn't have the same stigma that alcoholism still had in the 1970s. 
Alcoholics were sometimes perceived as morally weak, and drinking problems were still thought of as primarily willpower problems. Ford had an epiphany while in treatment, however. She observed another patient denying that her obvious alcoholism had caused anyone any pain, and realized this was exactly what she was doing. At the age of 60, Betty Ford finally admitted she was an alcoholic as well as a pain pill addict. Her experience in recovery inspired her to speak out about addiction issues and to found the Betty Ford Center. Having beat back her alcoholism and addiction to pain pills, Betty Ford assumed her serious health battles were over. However, less than 10 years later, a blockage was detected in her right carotid artery. As a result, Ford had to enter the hospital at the age of 69 to undergo quadruple bypass surgery. Although the initial procedure went well and she returned home, the Los Angeles Times reports that she endured a series of complications over a five-month period that required four more surgeries to correct. After the surgeries, Betty Ford went on to live another 24 years in relatively good health. The marriages of some politicians are more about appearances and connections than love and passion. However, Betty and Gerald Ford were the exception. Jerry spent nearly three decades in Congress before becoming first vice president and then president. And, as M. Live reports, Betty routinely took their four children to visit him at work on the weekends. Once together, Betty and Jerry would spend their time reading while the children played. According to the Saturday Evening Post, Betty often read the Bible with Jerry and then prayed with him in the evenings. The Fords were also extremely affectionate with one another. Betty once answered a question about how often they slept together by saying, quote, as often as possible. After the presidency, the Fords remained devoted to each other. When Jerry grew ill in 2006, Betty oversaw the transformation of their home into a hospital ward to care for him. When Jerry Ford died in 2006 at the age of 93, Betty Ford was heartbroken. Although not in the best of health herself, Betty insisted on participating in the state ceremonies to honor her husband, traveling from California to Washington, D.C., and then to Grand Rapids in order to take part. Five years later, on July 8, 2011, Betty Ford also passed away at the age of 93. A stolen presidential brain? That's just one of the weird things that's happened to a president's body after dying. Before George Washington died in 1799, he made his will and was quite clear on where and how he wanted to be buried. According to the official website to the First President's Virginia Plantation, Mount Vernon, he wanted to stay close to home, but he wasn't happy with the current options. He explained, the family vault at Mount Vernon requiring repairs and being improperly situated besides, I desire that a new one of brick and upon a larger scale may be built at the foot of what is commonly called the vineyard enclosure, in which my remains may be deposited. And it didn't happen at first. Washington's wishes were completely ignored by Congress and his widow, and a crypt was planned under the U.S. Capitol building. But by 1830, that hadn't happened. So Washington's remains were still in the old rundown crypt he'd said needed fixing more than 30 years before. Then, as explained in Stealing Lincoln's Body, John Augustine Washington II, who was George Washington's heir, fired a gardener at Mount Vernon. In retaliation, the gardener decided to steal the late president's skull. However, the tomb was in such bad shape that the bones of around 20 people were scattered all over and mixed together, meaning the gardener ended up with the skull of one of Washington's distant relatives. After that, a new tomb was erected within a year. In order to understand how weird John Tyler's post-life situation was, you need to know two things. He was a Southerner, and he died in 1862. That meant that in the middle of the Civil War, the 10th President of the United States was a citizen of the Confederacy. In the New York Times obituary for Tyler, the author did not hold back on how the ex-President was a traitor, reminding readers that after secession, Tyler had been elected to the Confederacy's legislature. The scathing obituary continued, He ended his life suddenly last Friday in Richmond, going down to death amid the ruins of his native state. He himself was one of the architects of its ruin, and beneath that melancholy wreck his name will be buried, instead of being inscribed on the Capitol's monumental marble, as a year ago he so much desired. Tyler was laid to rest in Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery. Their official page explains that despite his expressed wishes for a simple funeral, President Jefferson Davis made quite the statement by draping Tyler's coffin in a Confederate flag. As a result, Tyler's death wound up being the only presidential passing not officially recognized in Washington, D.C., and he was the only president buried beneath a different flag. Zachary Taylor, the 12th president of the United States, is definitely one of the lesser-known ones. Despite his unremarkable presidency, his death managed to be so weird that people were still obsessing about it almost a century and a half after he died in 1850. Taylor died a little over a year into his first term, at the age of 65. While this was a ripe old age in the mid-19th century, Taylor had been fine only days earlier. Politico says that he even attended a 4th of July ceremony. Five days later, he was dead. Immediately, some people theorized he'd been poisoned. 
The motive, so the conspiracy theory goes, was to get Taylor out of the way because he didn't want slavery to become legal in the country's western territories. So, rumor was that pro-slavery people poisoned the milk and cherries he ate at the Independence Day party. This was such a prominent conspiracy that, just to find out once and for all, in 1991, the body of the former president was exhumed. After lots of scientific tests, it turned out there was no poison. Kentucky's chief medical examiner explained that they found evidence of a myriad of natural diseases, which could have produced the symptoms of gastroenteritis. The assassination of President Abraham Lincoln was a shock, and for a nation that had just been through a civil war, the upheaval and grief must have seemed almost impossible to process. One can't help but think of all the good we could do if we had more time. Limitless time. In an era with no mass media, the Washington Post reports it was decided that Lincoln's body would go on an extensive journey around the country, giving people the chance to process and grieve, up close and personal. Lincoln's body was embalmed, something that had only just come to the public's attention due to soldiers being embalmed for shipment home when they died on the Civil War battlefields. But the technology was not yet perfected, and Lincoln's corpse was about to go through a lot. What followed was 19 days in an unsealed coffin traveling on a train, being moved for public viewing in 13 different cities. Even today, that would be asking a lot of an embalmer. Back then, the embalmer had to travel with Lincoln's body and re-embalm it at every stop, just to give the chemical facade a chance of working. Based on the reviews from the time, it didn't. The New York Times wrote about Lincoln's body when the funeral train stopped in that city and predicted, it will not be possible, despite the affection of the embalming, to continue much longer the exhibition, as the constant shaking of the body, aided by the exposure to the air and the increasing of dust, has already undone much of the workmanship. The strange odyssey of Abraham Lincoln's corpse wasn't over after his very long funeral journey ended and he was finally entombed in a marble sarcophagus in an Illinois cemetery. Turns out, in 1876, some rapscallions thought they would nip in and grab the body, then ransom it off for $200,000. He should, uh, you know, not be pointing at me during this particular line because it's a f sort of aggressive. As U.S. News & World Report explains, this was a lot easier than you'd think. There were no guards at the tomb, and the sarcophagus itself had just been lightly sealed and secured with one regular padlock, despite grave robbing and body snatching still being a common occurrence. Even though stealing Lincoln's body should have been easy, the gang of Chicago counterfeiters behind the planned crime managed to blow it by asking a government informant for help. When they got to the tomb, Secret Service agents were watching from out of sight. The men filed through the padlock and were attempting to open the heavy cover of the sarcophagus when a gunshot from outside made them scatter. In order that Lincoln would not risk being corpse-snatched by criminals who were better at their job, the president was secretly buried in the tomb's basement. Finally, in 1901, he was dug up again and buried in a steel cage 10 feet deep under tons of concrete. In 1923, President Warren G. Harding was relaxing with his wife Florence in a San Francisco hotel when he suddenly dropped dead. Although he wasn't feeling well on a stressful cross-country speaking tour and got food poisoning, he wasn't suddenly stopped living sick. Despite the fact that the sitting president of the United States had died for no obvious reason, PBS reports his widow refused an autopsy and insisted her husband be embalmed immediately. The presiding doctors were furious, with one writing, We shall never know exactly the immediate cause of President Harding's death since every effort that was made to secure an autopsy met with complete and final refusal. The public first blamed the doctors, but in 1930, a former Harding administration official slash con man with a grudge wrote a book making an outlandish claim about why Florence made these weird decisions. She poisoned her husband, probably because he was constantly cheating on her. According to the New York Times, Harding had an affair with a woman named Nan Britton, which produced a child. But considering there wasn't any way to be sure back then, it was just an allegation. Now, oh, history will only remember you and your lake-based erotic poetry. <laughs> well, actually, they will remember one more thing. In 2020, that child's child wanted to prove he was Harding's grandson, because even though there was ancestry and DNA evidence, some of Harding's legitimate descendants questioned it. However, once exhumation became a possibility, the holdouts relented and said there was no need to dig up the late president. Franklin D. Roosevelt was a very ill man when he died in 1945, having served three terms as president and seen the country through the Great Depression and World War II. But even though he was obviously unwell, his actual death was sudden. According to Till Death Did Us Part, the story of the health and death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president was at one of his vacation homes when he said he had what he described as a terrific pain in the back of my head and passed out. He would die three hours later. 
Time was of the essence, since embalming works best the sooner it's done to a body. However, in Roosevelt's case, The Undertaker wasn't even contacted until four hours after Roosevelt died, and then they had to wait until Eleanor Roosevelt showed up since she was the next of kin. It had been nine hours when they finally began the embalming process, and as The Undertaker F. Hayden Snodderly recorded in great detail afterwards, there were lots of issues which made getting the embalming fluid into his veins almost impossible. With the time element, you can readily understand and realize what a difficult case we had to prepare. Rumors circulated that Roosevelt hadn't been able to be embalmed at all because he had been poisoned and his body turned black. Despite this accusation appearing in a book in 1948, it's not true. If you, like thousands of people every year, go visit John F. Kennedy's grave in Arlington National Cemetery, just know that you aren't standing on top of all of him. The body in the grave is missing a key bit, the brain. Even worse, no one actually knows where it is. So how did someone lose the brain of one of the United States' most famous and revered presidents? Well, after JFK was assassinated in 1963, his body was autopsied, and the brain was placed in a stainless steel container with a screw-top lid, which was then stored in a file cabinet in the office of the Secret Service. From there, it was placed in a footlocker and brought to a secure room in the National Archives. This must have made sense to someone. But then, according to James Swanson, author of End of Days, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy, in October 1966, it was discovered that the brain, the tissue slides, and other autopsy materials were missing, and they have never been seen since. This is obviously a conspiracy theorist's dream, but Swanson's reasoning on why the brain disappeared might shock even them. He suggested, my conclusion is that Robert Kennedy did take his brother's brain, not to conceal evidence of a conspiracy, but perhaps to conceal evidence of the true extent of President Kennedy's illnesses, or perhaps to conceal evidence of the number of medications that President Kennedy was taking. I'm calling it. Yeah. It's 1 p.m. John Harrison wasn't a U.S. president, but he was the ultimate U.S. president adjacent person. He was the son of the ninth president, William Henry Harrison, and the father of the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison. And unfortunately for the then future president, Benjamin, something weird happened to his father's body after he died. John was 73 when he died in 1878, three years before Benjamin was elected. Cincinnati Magazine reports that the Harrison family had learned about a grave in the cemetery that had been robbed recently, and the body of a man named Augustus Devon was stolen. To be sure that wouldn't happen to John, they buried him with extraordinary precautions, topped off with a guard watching over the grave for a full month. After the funeral, Benjamin and his brother decided to help out the Devons and search local medical schools for Augustus' body, but they'd get more than they bargained for. At one college, they noticed a rope going down a shaft and realized the body was on the other end, so they pulled it up. In a New York Times article, Benjamin is alleged to have revealed, Attached to the rope by a hook was the body of my own father. They had known at the college whose the body was. They had taken this fiendishly ingenious method of moving it from floor to floor as we in our search had moved from one floor to another. Somehow, John Harrison had been removed from his grave, and Benjamin Harrison was the one to find him. The White House spouses spend plenty of time in the limelight and even wield soft power. Few would admit they have real sway. Except perhaps when it comes to Edith Wilson, wife of President Woodrow Wilson. Let's find out what made her such a remarkable first lady. The Bowling family and daughter Edith, born in 1872, had a pretty illustrious Virginian heritage, claiming descent from Pocahontas, Thomas Jefferson, and Martha Washington. In another era, perhaps, Edith Bowling would have grown up to become a high-class Southern debutante with a wide range of perks and social connections. But the country was in the midst of reconstruction after the brutal Civil War. Times were tough for Southerners who had previously benefited from the old inhumane system and Edith's grandfather lost control of the family plantation. Her father then worked as a lawyer supporting the Bowling clan, but now they were living above a store in Wytheville, Virginia, hardly the palatial estate of a kind enjoyed by other first ladies. Though she eventually gained a reputation as an intelligent and energetic woman, young Edith didn't receive much in the way of a formal education. As the C-SPAN series First Ladies reports, this was a bit odd. Her sisters attended school like any other children of the time, so we can't properly blame prevailing cultural attitudes or even necessarily the individual quirks of the Bowling family. Instead, it appears that Edith, along with her family, decided that she wasn't necessarily suited to more formalized education. Edith, however, was not left to run wild. In return for caring for her paternal grandmother, Edith got an informal education from her older relative, covering the basics of math, literacy, and traditional homemaking skills like sewing. 
Edith also learned a kind of pidgin French from her grandmother that was mixed with English. And while it wasn't a formal skill, Edith soon grew to make strong and quick judgments like her grandmother, a personality trait that arguably helped her catch the eye of a future president. Eventually, as biography points out, Edith enrolled in school, though it wasn't a wild success. She reportedly dropped out of Martha Washington College because it was too cold, and it's easy enough to wonder if she simply wasn't inclined to the structured environment of higher education and finishing schools. Though her beginnings were rather obscure, Edith eventually managed to find her way into some pretty powerful circles, as the 1944 film Wilson dramatizes, but it was a long time coming. Edith didn't even leave her hometown until she was already 12 years old. Some years later, while visiting one of her married sisters in Washington, D.C., she connected with a wealthy jewelry magnate named Norman Galt, and the pair married in 1896. During their 12 years of marriage, Edith became a comfortable society wife, though the two never had children. Biography reports that she was barred from true society life, having gained wealth through the business interests of her husband and not through inheritance. After Norman died suddenly in 1908, though, Edith was left in charge of the business, delegating much of the work to a manager while she plotted out her personal ambitions. These ambitions included making social connections in the nation's capital. According to biography, she and her friend Altrude Gordon eventually became close with Helen Bones, President Woodrow Wilson's cousin, who was living with the president as a companion while Woodrow mourned the death of his first wife, Ellen Axon Wilson. Edith, Altrude, and Helen returned to the White House one day after a hike, reportedly quite muddy. As the story goes, President Wilson was captivated by the energetic Edith and pushed to get to know her better. Cousin Woodrow, I want you to know my friend, Mrs. Gold. I'm delighted, Mrs. Gold. The pair embarked on a whirlwind, arguably scandalous courtship. Presidential Studies Quarterly notes that the two exchanged rather romantic letters and may have breached rules of state, with Woodrow even sharing official documents with her, apparently to impress her and to get her opinion. And Edith enjoyed it, writing to him, Much as I love your delicious love letters, I believe I enjoy even more the ones in which you tell me of what you are working on, for then I feel I am sharing your work and being taken into partnership as it were. I need you, Edith. Will you be my wife? President. The pair married on December 18, 1915, less than a year after their initial meeting. Thrust into the role of First Lady rather quickly, Edith apparently didn't much enjoy the traditional social protocol of being the President's wife, according to the Miller Center, so she hired a secretary to manage her social engagements. When the country entered World War I, she gave a non-traditional thrifty example for other Americans. Fluffier aspects of First Ladyship, like the annual Easter egg roll on the White House lawn and seemingly endless dinners and teas, stopped for a while. Instead, Edith set rationing standards for dinner like, quote, meatless Mondays and allowed sheep to graze on the White House lawn instead of hiring expensive gardeners. She took on more war-related duties, too, knitting and sewing goods for American soldiers and getting herself out in public to volunteer with the Red Cross, including at the busy train hub of Union Station. Even before his stroke, Woodrow Wilson often showed state documents to his wife and asked her opinion. Edith Wilson even decoded several military messages. As the Miller Center reports, some officials thought she had too much influence. The president's advisors had initially tried to keep the union from happening, coming so quickly after the death of Woodrow's first wife. But the marriage did happen, and President Wilson started seeking Edith's opinion on high matters of state. She also sought to oust those who critiqued her union with Woodrow. The first female president of the United States. According to the National First Lady's Library, President Wilson shared the key to his private desk drawer with her, shared wartime codes, and took her advice on how to deal with his fellow politicians. Edith even sometimes sat in on meetings between Woodrow and top-level officials. Though she wielded considerable power as a First Lady, Edith Wilson didn't always allow for the same freedom in other women. While she and her husband were skeptical of the women's suffrage movement that sought to give all American women the right to vote. Early on in his political life, as Political Science Quarterly relates, Woodrow even wrote that, I get a chilled, scandalized feeling that always overcomes me when I see and hear women speak in public. As laid out in Britannica, the president once ordered that suffragists protesting in front of the White House should be arrested. Edith referred to the women protesters as, quote, those devils in the workhouse. Though Woodrow eventually softened his stance by supporting an amendment granting women the right to vote, there's no evidence that Edith felt the same way. She could still be progressive in other respects, however. Edith earned the first driver's license issued to a woman in Washington, D.C., as the Chicago Tribune reports, and could be seen driving around in an electric car. Though World War I was officially over by 1918, the stress and anxiety caused by the conflict would affect Edith and Woodrow for years to come. PBS reports that in the immediate aftermath of the war, Woodrow spent months overseas negotiating the Treaty of Versailles. 
Even though it marked the end of hostilities, Congress met it with resistance and gave Woodrow a pretty hard time over the matter. When President Wilson returned to the United States to begin promoting an international organization of countries in the wake of the war called the League of Nations, things got even worse. He went on a nationwide speaking tour to promote the League, including Edith and his retinue on the three-and-a-half-week venture. But I can't stop now. People are beginning to understand. She found the president in a dire state after a September 1919 engagement in Pueblo, Colorado. His face was drooping, his muscles were twitching, and he complained of an intense headache. It appeared that this was a mini-stroke that preceded an even bigger one the following month in the White House. Again, Edith found him, got Woodrow back into bed, and called the White House chief usher, telling him that, quote, the president is very sick. That second stroke was debilitating. According to PBS, President Wilson's doctor, Carrie T. Grayson, upon seeing him after the October 1919 event, was horrified, diagnosing the president as paralyzed. And a paralyzed president was no good for governing a nation, much less promoting his League of Nations idea. Yet Edith Wilson and a small circle of officials were determined to keep the truth of Woodrow's condition a secret. According to biography, she became her husband's gatekeeper, carefully screening visitors and documents while crafting press releases stating he was simply overworked and needed a bit of rest. And when Woodrow did have in-person meetings, Edith was often there and helping her husband hide the true nature and extent of what had happened to him. By February 1920, however, news was trickling out. Rumors flew that the president was ill, insane, or both, and that someone else was running the nation in his stead. But as the Chicago Tribune reports, in an age without social media and nearly instantaneous reporting, it was hard to get the exact truth out of the White House. Even the vice president didn't really know what was going on with his own running mate until more than three weeks after Woodrow Wilson's health crisis. Later in life, Edith would downplay her power in the White House after her husband's stroke. She often said she was only acting in Woodrow's interest, trying to keep him healthy and stress-free. After all, as she might have rightfully argued, it was stress that got them into this mess in the first place, rather than trying to take the reins of power. As quoted in Presidential Studies Quarterly, an older Edith wrote that, I myself never made a single decision regarding the disposition of public affairs. The only decision that was mine was what was important and what was not, and the very important decision of when to present matters to my husband. Edith Wilson didn't exactly become a, quote, secret president. According to the National First Lady's Library, she often let the cabinet deal with political issues. Yet she wasn't above taking more of a leading role when she had a stake in those issues. Once, she refused to let the government accept a diplomat's credentials until he dismissed someone who had made jokes at her expense. And no matter what she said, she had considerable power just by controlling the flow of information to the president after a stroke. Though he eventually recovered somewhat from a stroke, Woodrow Wilson never fully regained his strength. Neither did his project of kickstarting the League of Nations. And as history reports, the whole situation had more or less become public knowledge by the early months of 1920, though Edith Wilson's role in the White House after her husband's stroke apparently wasn't well understood. The National First Lady's Library indicates that Edith Wilson might have inadvertently had a hand in the failed League of Nations proposal, as she could have advised Woodrow to compromise to get the legislation passed. Yet it's hard to pin the blame on a single person, much less someone who was operating in an informal capacity like Edith was. Either way, she continued to screen documents and visitors for her husband after they left presidential life. She was even reportedly considered as a vice presidential candidate in 1928, four years after Woodrow died. That never happened, but she enjoyed acclaim and recognition nonetheless. She wrote an autobiography, My Memoir, published in 1938, and in that book she presented the image of a loving wife to President Wilson who didn't meddle in political affairs. But as the record shows, she was more than that. Still active in national politics long after she left the White House, Edith supported John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign and lived to attend his inauguration in 1961. It was her last public appearance and a fitting end to her trailblazing career as First Lady of the United States. Being the president isn't easy, but it's not so easy being a different part of the first family either. From widespread scrutiny to security protocols, there's plenty about being in the White House that is pretty restrictive and annoying. These are the rules America's first families always have to follow. The lead up to January 20th, better known as Inauguration Day, gets pretty busy for an incoming first family. There are transitions to manage, staff and cabinet positions to hire and appoint, and a multitude of meetings and briefings that have nothing to do with the moving vans. Making things more complicated is that the new first family can't move into their new place even one minute early, 
Incoming first families and their staff aren't allowed to start the process of moving into the White House until around 11 a.m. on Inauguration Day. That's when the outgoing president, the incoming one, and their entourages all head off from a hopefully civil coffee date to the inauguration ceremony. While they're switching over presidents, a full move-in team leaps into action. Their mission? To move out all of the old stuff and bring in the new. This massive undertaking doesn't just involve luggage or furniture. Move-in day can also mean repainting some areas, changing out carpets, and setting things up like the new first family has always been there, right down to the toiletries in the bathroom cabinet. West Wing staffers, meanwhile, aren't allowed into their new offices until the president's officially in, which means they might be waiting for hours. To help with the effort, some outgoing staff members reportedly worked for up to a week without their personal effects, all so move-in day can speed along as quickly and efficiently as possible. Consider the simple pleasure of opening a window. Maybe it's a little stuffy in your house, especially if you happen to live in, say, a neoclassical mansion that's been continuously inhabited since the 19th century and has a full staff walking around everywhere. It would be lovely to just open a window or two and get a fresh breeze going, right? Well, if you're a member of the first family, too bad. Those windows pose a pretty significant security risk. If you try to open one, it's all but certain that you'll have a member of the Secret Service at your side in a moment, respectfully asking you to take your hand off the sill. Same thing if you attempt to roll down the window in your motorcade. First Lady Michelle Obama said that one of the things she looked forward to most in her post-White House life was this very action. I want to go to Target! <laughs> I'm sorry, Madam First Lady, drive. you don't have security clearance to open that I window. I can't open my windows. I wow. really can't. She recalled that as a treat, her Secret Service lead agent once allowed her to roll down the car window for a mere five minutes on the way to Camp David, the president's country retreat. Within the first two weeks of their term, the president has to have a plan ready. Not for their goodbye to the office four or eight years later, but a far more irrevocable goodbye. This means that, by the time February is finished, the president should have planned their own funeral. It makes sense when you think about it. Four sitting presidents have been assassinated, with yet more surviving failed attempts on their lives. So, grim as it may be, it makes sense for a president to make their wishes for their funeral and burial arrangements known. The U.S. government, much like any other administration, is a complex thing that needs as much planning as possible. It would at least ease things somewhat if a team already knew what a deceased president wanted, whether they passed from natural causes or not. Still, it must be a chilling thing to put down on paper, both for the president and the rest of the first family. Though it's clearly a high-pressure job, surely there are some bright spots to being a member of the first family. Think about all of those diplomatic trips, the far-flung locales, the interesting people one gets to meet, and of course, those nice gifts given to you by presidents, popes, and more. Well, except you don't get to keep any of those presents. Oh, you thought those were for you? Of course not. According to the Congressional Research Service, the president legally cannot receive personal gifts from foreign dignitaries and members of state, assuming that said gift is more than minimal value. That would skirt far too close to bribery, you see. The same rules apply to the first family. Gift giving still happens, though, so what's the deal? Instead of personally accepting an ultra-valuable bauble, the president or other members of the first family is actually accepting it on behalf of the United States and its people. It eventually gets passed into the hands of the National Archives and Records Administration, where it presumably goes to sit in a vault somewhere and gather dust forever. Cell phones are ubiquitous nowadays, but they can be vulnerable to attacks from hackers. That's bad enough for everyday folks, but consider the issues that might come up for the president and first family. They could get some very sensitive messages and calls that come through on their mobile phones to the point where national security might be at risk. That's why most presidents and their families have installed rigorous security features on their phones. That includes routinely switching out phones and allowing security experts to take a look at their devices on a regular basis. I can't use uh, phones with recorders in them. So oh. a lot of the newfangled stuff for security reasons I don't get. President Barack Obama reportedly handed his phone over every month so staffers could make sure he hadn't been hacked or had his communications otherwise compromised. However, this isn't a hard and fast rule. Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States, repeatedly declined this advice, describing the security measures as inconvenient. 
Despite what it may look like, the first family hardly gets a free ride during their time in the White House. The president and their family can rack up quite a bill for themselves between personal costs, food bills, and sometimes legal fees. Hillary Clinton, who served as First Lady during her husband Bill Clinton's two terms in office from 1993 to 2001, even went so far as to say that her family left the White House dead broke. Given the legal costs incurred during President Clinton's impeachment trial and the Monica Lewinsky scandal, that's pretty believable. Former First Lady Laura Bush backed up this claim. In her memoir, Spoken from the Heart, Bush wrote that when it comes to presidential room and board, the room is covered. The board is not, though presidents and their families are fortunately not responsible for a mortgage or utility bills. The Obamas also had to pay for their own meals, including, as The Guardian reports, their Thanksgiving dinner. Their personal costs also included mundane things like clothes, toiletries, and private parties like the one Barack Obama threw for his wife Michelle's 50th birthday. While the president is off doing the business of running the country, the first lady must contend with her own rules. A few of these tasks might be tough for someone who doesn't necessarily consider themselves to be stylish or fashion forward, but tradition and outside pressure dictates that they at least put forth an effort. We keep it in tip-top shape. We call it sometimes tippy-top shape. First ladies are generally expected to put their own spin on the inside of the White House, to the point where many have hired their own interior decorator to spruce up the look of the place. Architectural Digest writes that the modern version of this tradition largely stems from First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, whose extensive restoration efforts eventually made it to a live television broadcast. Both Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton made an effort to include the work of American artists in public and private spaces throughout the White House. Earlier first ladies took it even further, as when Bess Truman had the deteriorating structure gutted and completely refurbished in 1948. First ladies are also supposed to extend this energy into the holidays. Beginning in the 20th century, the first lady began to pick an annual Christmas theme, complete with elaborately decorated trees and other holiday decorations. Currently, there's no word on whether or not a hypothetical first gentleman would be expected to care about an official state Christmas tree or redoing the wallpaper in the master bedroom. Though the first family is traditionally supposed to manage things like redecorating, some historic rooms are off limits. In fact, First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy pushed to have the White House officially declared a museum, which it was in 1961. This means that, though the first family can put their mark on some parts of the White House, they have to follow strict rules while doing so. Sometimes they're not allowed to even think about touching the most historic parts of the building. The historic nature of the White House is such a big deal that the building even has its own curator. This is no small job either. The White House curator must care for an estimated 50,000 pieces in the permanent collection. They sometimes also have to gently lay down the law, while also considering that the building is also a home that's subject to a semi-chaotic changeover every four to eight years as presidential administrations move on. The upside of this is that the first family at least has a high-class collection of artworks and objects they can carefully sort through and use to decorate their spaces. They just have to remember to respect the historic space in which they live and also to play nice with the current White House curator. For many adults, driving themselves around is a privilege that they may not even recognize as such. Indeed, they may dream of the luxury of having a dedicated driver who will motor them about town as needed. For presidents, however, that luxury may start to seem restrictive after only a short time. Neither presidents nor vice presidents are allowed to drive on public roads. Former holders of either office are restricted from driving as well. In 2017, former President George W. Bush revealed to Jay Leno that he hasn't driven on a public road in 25 years because of this rule. I have not driven on a road since 93. Wow. Technically, it's not a law, but this directive is pretty strongly encouraged for security reasons. The president or vice president and their entourage are usually driven by Secret Service agents who have extensive training in evasive and defensive driving. Hillary Clinton, whose runs as a presidential candidate and term as Obama's Secretary of State garnered her own security detail, has said, One of the regrets I have about public life is that I can't drive anymore. A president might be able to drive themselves if they're on a private road, but they almost always have an agent right next to them in case something goes wrong. For many, that's the only chance they have to get behind the wheel once the White House has entered their life. Some of the rules the first family are obliged to follow are odd, but at least they make sense. Others are just odd. 
Consider the annual White House Easter egg roll. The tradition got started in 1876. On Easter Monday of that year, an estimated 10,000 children made their way to Capitol Hill carrying colorful dyed eggs. The area was just perfect for the old occupation of egg rolling. The kids tore up the lawn, however, and Congress told them they were no longer welcome. Two years later, a group of kids approached the White House and asked if they could use the mansion's lawn for egg rolling purposes and to avoid the killjoys on Capitol Hill. President Rutherford B. Hayes gave them the go-ahead and an official annual tradition was born. The White House Easter egg roll has now been going on for well over a century. There have been a few interruptions, namely during World Wars I and II. It's traditionally hosted by the First Lady and the rest of the First Family, who also need to think about the design for a custom wooden Easter egg given to attendees, a tradition begun by First Lady Nancy Reagan. Though they have all lived in a fancy historic mansion with a full staff on call, many first kids have been expected to do their part. For quite a few, that's meant a burden common to many kids throughout the nation. Chores. Of course, this will vary from family to family. The New York Times reports that the Obamas were especially adamant that their daughters Sasha and Malia were expected to continue with their chore list even though they'd moved into one of the most famous homes in the nation. First Lady Michelle Obama even made sure to let the staff know that they could skip making their first daughter's beds, saying in an interview with ABC News, they have to learn these things. Many have agreed that routine and structure is important for children growing up in the White House, where intense public scrutiny could be punishing for adults as well as kids. Michelle and I try to emphasize to them that they don't want to be uh, in the on news. TMZ. A disastrous lottery, the loss of an entire library, and the fate of one very controversial relationship. Thomas Jefferson may have once had control of the country, but who controlled his estate after he died? Keep watching to find out. Though Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died on the same day, settling the two presidents' estates could not have been more different. While both incurred significant amounts of debt in their lifetimes, John Adams died debt-free and owned 275 acres of land. Thanks to help from his son, John Adams died in a position where he could bequeath both land and books to Quincy, Massachusetts to start a school. Things did not run so smoothly for Thomas Jefferson, and much of what he bequeathed in his will never made it to his intended recipients. Jefferson was in debt for most of his life due to several factors. Much of his income relied on agriculture, which was not his strongest skill set. Compound that with a lavish lifestyle and debts inherited from family and friends, and he wasn't the fountain of wealth one might imagine. Jefferson spent his last months scrambling to sort out his affairs. He knew that he'd been afforded lenience as a founder of the Constitution and a former president. Should his debts be passed down to his daughter Martha Jefferson Randolph, she would not receive the same consideration. So Jefferson and his grandson Thomas Jefferson Randolph devised a scheme to resolve their financial woes, a lottery. Though initially well-received, the lottery was halted when a group of well-meaning citizens from New York offered to raise the money instead. To their disappointment, the money raised didn't come close to the amount needed. In the meantime, the lottery had lost much of its steam. Ever the optimist, Jefferson died believing that the lottery would solve his dire financial situation. His daughter Martha said that he died tranquil, so strong was his hope for the lottery. The Saturday Evening Post recalled that he even wrote to his grandson, As these misfortunes have been held back for my last days, when few remain to me, I duly acknowledge that I have gone through a long life, with fewer circumstances of affliction than are the lots of most men. His optimism did not match reality, and the public's enthusiasm for the lottery dwindled. Eventually, his family members canceled the lottery entirely. After Jefferson's death, his daughter Martha inherited his debts, as he feared. In 1831, she sold his Monticello home and the 130 enslaved people held in bondage there. Eventually, his grandson took on paying back his grandfather's debts, the last payment occurring 50 years after Jefferson's death. Thomas Jefferson, who penned the sentiment, all men are created equal, famously had an ambivalent relationship with the true meaning of the words. Smithsonian Magazine reports that Jefferson traded his early abolitionist beliefs for the profits that chattel slavery afforded him as the plantation owner. As George Washington was planning emancipation at Mount Vernon, having disavowed slavery, Smithsonian Magazine says that Jefferson mortgaged the enslaved people he held to build Monticello. Out of the 600 enslaved people held on his estate over his lifetime, Jefferson had only freed two before his death. According to the Washington Post, his will only freed five more. The auction block meant family separation for the rest of the enslaved people held at Monticello. 
Families were sold to as many as eight different buyers, and the families of the five freed people were not spared from separation either. Joseph Fawcett, freed by Jefferson's will, worked for 10 years to buy the rest of his family's freedom. In the end, he was only able to save his wife while his four children remained enslaved. Looked at in full, you find a man whose life was made possible by slavery. The brothers Madison and Eston Hemings were two of the enslaved people freed by Jefferson's will. According to the New York Times, historical records and DNA evidence point to Jefferson as their biological father. Much is unknown about the nature of the relationship between Jefferson and their mother, Sally Hemings, an enslaved woman held at Monticello. Jefferson fathered her six children, starting from when she was 16 years old. The complexities of the relationship have been debated for a long time, and while there's a lot that remains unknown, we do know that Sally Hemings negotiated for the freedom of her children. Hemings accompanied Jefferson's family to Paris, experiencing legal freedom and the vibrant cultural, artistic, and intellectual milieu. Two years later, pregnant, she refused to return to Virginia unless Jefferson agreed to extraordinary privileges for herself and freedom for her future children. Her daughters, Beverly and Harriet, were allowed to leave Monticello four years before Jefferson's death. Though never officially freed, they slipped into white society undiscovered but unable to mention their roots or heritage. I stood up and I proudly said, Thomas Jefferson is my great, 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 great grandfather. And the teacher said, sit down and stop telling lies. Jefferson never freed Sally Hemings. After Jefferson's death, his daughter Martha Jefferson Randolph unofficially freed her and allowed her to move to Charlottesville, Virginia to live with her sons. In addition to the Monticello Plantation, Thomas Jefferson owned and ran the Poplar Forest Plantation. He had inherited the 4,819 acres in Bedford County, Virginia from his father-in-law in 1773. Used primarily for tobacco, overseers and roughly 100 enslaved persons held in bondage operated the plantation, which also served as a favorite retreat. Jefferson turned over the property to his grandson, Francis Wallace Epis, in 1822 at the time of Epis's marriage. Later, upon hearing of his grandfather's financial difficulties, Epis tried to return Poplar Forest, but Jefferson refused. Later, Jefferson's will officially bequeathed the plantation to Epis. Two years later, Epis sold Poplar Forest and relocated to Florida, establishing another plantation. Jefferson was renowned for his library, but his debts compromised his personal library's fate. His will expresses his desire to donate his books to the University of Virginia. However, to settle his debts posthumously, the contents of Monticello's library were sold at two estate sales, one in Washington, D.C., and another in Philadelphia. Francis Epis followed suit and sold the Poplar Forest Library in New York City in 1873. Thomas Jefferson's will seems to be a fitting final document for the former president. The contradiction between his wishes and the reality at hand speaks to his complex legacy. Death, a peanut business, and a surprising outlook on romance. This is the enduring love story of Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. Politics and romance aren't your typical bedfellows, but against all odds, some couples do manage to survive inside the halls of power. Take Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. The love between Jimmy and Rosalind began nearly a century ago in the small town of Plains, Georgia. This is where the future president met and fell in love with Eleanor Rosalind Smith, the woman who would later become his wife of 75 years. Jimmy Carter's mother Lillian was the first person in the Carter family to meet Rosalind. In fact, she was one of the first people to meet Rosalind full stop. Lillian, a local nurse, had made the short commune next door to help her neighbors, Wilbur and Ali Smith, deliver their first child, Rosalind, into the world. Although Jimmy and Rosalind grew up next door to each other, it wasn't until almost 17 years later, when when Carter was home from the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, that something changed between them. One fateful day, Carter saw Rosalind walking down the street with her best friend, who happened to be Carter's younger sister, Ruth. On a whim, he decided to ask her to the movies. Carter had another date fall through that night, so Rosalind was a backup plan of sorts. Still, it seems that things worked out for the best. After the movies, Jimmy and Rosalind shared their first kiss. He knew right then what fate had in store for them. Years later, Jimmy revealed, when I first had a date with her, the next morning I told my mother, that was the girl I wanted to marry. In fact, Carter was so certain that Rosalind was his soulmate that he proposed that very same year. After rejecting his first proposal in order to finish school, Rosalind eventually agreed that they should get married. On a warm Sunday in July 1946, the two said their I do's at the Plains Methodist Church, situated in the same town that had raised them. This is where the Carter's love story diverges from the traditional small-town cookie-cutter narrative, however. 
While Jimmy and Rosalind Carter's early life as a married couple was draped in the saccharine romance of a Hollywood blockbuster, their marriage was not immune to difficulty. After a blissful eight years filled with babies, deployments, and career highs, Jimmy Carter's military career abruptly ended after his father died of cancer. Carter immediately resigned from the Navy in order to return home and run the family's peanut business. For the first time in their marriage, Rosalind was not on board with his plans. What followed was an admittedly rocky period in the Carter's life. To Rosalind, it felt like she was moving back in time, to a town that harbored memories of a difficult childhood. However, Rosalind dutifully followed her husband, and the two worked through this rocky period. Famously, they once banded together to stand up against a racist group of farmers who had called out Carter for refusing to maintain the segregated status quo of the South. It was Jimmy and Rosalind Carter's dedication to family, their strong moral compass, and their commitment to combating racist institutions that eventually resulted in this underdog couple winning the 1976 presidential election. While former President Carter only served one term in office, he made it a productive one. Carter publicly advocated for civil rights, consistently shirked the political status quo, and sharpened a previously blurry focus on human rights when drafting American foreign policy. Despite all that, however, the most impressive title the Carters have earned is longest married presidential couple. With more than three quarters of a century under their belts, the duo has beaten themselves the past three years in a row for that elusive title. If you're looking for the secret to fostering a decades-long marriage, former President Carter shared his advice in Marlo Thomas and Phil Donahue's book, What Makes a Marriage Last. According to Carter himself, the key to a happy relationship is to simply give each other plenty of space.